Hey yo, what is up? In this video, we're gonna go over 67. That is right, 67 simple strategies, shortcuts, techniques for you to become a push three master. And once you can get even just a handful of these under your fingers as you're interacting with push three, you will truly unlock it to its full potential. Push three is just like playing an instrument because it is an expressive instrument first and foremost. And just like any instrument, you do have to practice it to develop a relationship with it, get the muscle memory, and wrap your mind around how to use it. And once that becomes intuitive, you are off and running using this to make amazing music. All right, so we've got 67 of these to go through. Let's get it going. I really love to lay my pads out in the drum rack in a symmetrical way so that you can roll your hands similar to playing a real drum kit because I played a real drum kit before getting onto push. Really get some fun stuff going if you can alternate your hands, right? that kind of stuff. So with a basic guitar pedal like this, I can plug this into any of the pedal ports at the back to control push. If I go into pedal port one, this gives me hands-free control of the record function where a simple tap toggles the record button. And then while playback is running, tapping this will toggle between recording overdubs and continuing playback with the selected clip. All right, so it's super handy for jamming out ideas hands-free to just have a pedal plugged into port one of push three. And just a quick tip is if you quickly double tap, it acts like the new button, which will either create a new scene or a new clip. Super handy for staying in flow. If you go to the farthest menu just by clicking left on this encoder, you can access all of your user library, your packs, your samples, all this from that top menu. When you're browsing your sounds, let's say you find something that you like, you can also add it to your collections just like you could in Ableton to save your favorites, right? So let's say you really like this bass sound, you could just hit this button over favorites to save it to the red color of your favorites, right? If you wanted to access different colors, all you have to do is move this encoder and you can access orange, yellow, green, blue, and add this to multiple groups if you wanted to right? Just by navigating and then pressing that display button. And once you've added, let's say a sound to your favorites, you can access all of your favorites and your different categories for your collections by going back and selecting the collections in your browser. If you want to access a deeper level of parameters of both devices or effects, you can hit the button once again and you'll access more of the parameters of that device if you want to get in the nitty gritty and design something specific and then when you want to go back to the main level of uh, browsing you just hit back and then you're back at your top level right you can disable devices simply by holding mute and hitting them and you'll notice that it gets grayed out and all the parameters are grayed out so if you want to eliminate devices without necessarily deleting them, that's a super good thing to do. If you want to re-enable any devices, you can hold mute and press it again. Pro tip for you, if you want to move the position of a MIDI or audio effect, all you have to do is press and hold the display button over that effect and then move the encoder to move its position. So maybe I want this phaser to be in front of this delay instead of vice versa. So all I have to do is press and hold this and then move this encoder and you'll notice that it got moved one, two positions over. And now I let go and it's in the position that I want. One thing to note is that the browser will show you the device category of the original device. If I hit the hot swap button, you'll notice that we are in the presets for the Echo device. If I go back out of here and maybe we go to the phaser and I do the hot swap button, you'll notice that we are in the presets for the phaser flanger device. Pro tip here is that you can get additional track options by holding the shift button here and then pressing the display button under a track, right? You'll notice that we get all of these other options. We can rename the track, we can group the track, we can ungroup the track, freeze the track or flatten it, and we can change the color. A pro tip is that you can actually group tracks directly on push three. So all you have to do to do that is hold select select the tracks that you want to group, right? Let go, hold shift, hit one of the selected tracks, hit group, and there you go. Now you have a group with both of these tracks inside of it. If you want to close the group, you can hit the group display button, open it up, hit it once again, and you can select the tracks inside it. And if you wanted to, you could add devices onto the whole group. A fun fact with the drum rack too is you can hold this to see all of your different samples, so your kicks, your hi-hats, 
kick again, hi-hat open again, and select them that way. Pro tip here is if you have an instrument rack that contains multiple chains, you can hold the display button of that rack and all the chains will be shown to you and then you can select from a different chain. So for example, I have this BS1, which is a bass instrument, right? If I wanted to press and hold this, it shows that I have two chains here and I could select the other chain, right? Another pro tip is you can hold shift and move this encoder to adjust in increments of 0.1 BPM or to fine adjust the swing. The swing amount that you set with this encoder will affect the quantize function, which we'll look at in just a bit, as well as the repeat function when you are playing a note. Pro tip, if you wanna save a live set as a new live set or as a new project, and I do this all the time in my workflow, you can hold shift and then press the save button, and this will actually save it as a new version. You can see version two has now been saved. Now we're working in a copy of the set we were previously working in. Another pro tip is that if you want to save a set as a new project and you wanna save it into a new project folder, you can hold the duplicate button and then hit save. And what this will do is create a whole new project folder. So if you have a sound that you really like or something that you've designed and you wanna save it as a preset to your user library, all you have to do is make sure you select that device and then you're gonna hold save and press that device to save it into your user library. To then access all the presets and devices in your user library, all you have to do is hit the plus button and then go to your device and then go to your user library here, select it, and then you'll see all of your presets that you've saved over here. You can also delete and rename contents. If you wanna rename something, all you have to do is highlight it in the browser and then move the jog wheel to the right and select rename. In general, the layout of the pad colors for drum rack are as follows. If the pad has a color, it means it has a sound. If a pad is gray, so for example, if I hold delete and delete this pad and click over there, you'll notice that it's unlit and it's gray. And that means that this pad is empty. Okay. If the pad is green, it means it's being played. As you can see, when I play a pad, it gets lit up green. And this will also happen when a pad is being sequenced by a sequence that you've programmed. When a pad is white, it means that it is selected. So when I hit a pad, you'll notice that it becomes selected as soon as I hit it. If I hold the solo button and hit a pad, you'll notice that it turns dark blue. And that means that this is the only pad that you will hear because it is soloed. Similarly, you can hold mute and hit a pad, which will dim the color of that pad, which makes it muted, right? And it won't play back until you again hold mute and re-enable it. Pro tip here is if you hold shift and press up, you will move by a single row of pads instead of the whole grid. Pro tip, if you want to select a sound in your drum pads without triggering it, you can hold select and touch that pad to select it without having to play it first. Pro tip, if you want to delete all of the steps of a specific drum rack pad in a sequence, you can hold delete and hit that pad to delete all of the steps. In clip view, you can hold a pad or group of pads to access various editing controls, such as nudge, length, velocity, etc. And then you can edit those parameters with their corresponding knobs. So for example, right here, we have our kick. And if we go ahead and press and hold these, you'll notice that it selects them in clip view and we have access to all these controls that pop up. Pro tip is that you can quickly set the length of your loop to being one page by quickly double tapping one of these loop pads. If I double tap this, you'll notice that it immediately just selects this bar and starts looping it. I could do the same with bar three, with bar two, bar four, do bar one to four, one to two, etc. Pro tip that in this mode, what you see isn't necessarily what you hear. If you, for example, select this first pad, go to the pad four and we have a loop of four bars now and I press play you'll notice that it keeps going and then we're seeing now bar three and bar four but maybe you don't want to do that maybe you only want to see bar one and two and edit it while it still plays back all four bars so to do that all you have to do is tap one of these bars and it will highlight that so now we're looking at bar three and four up here but if I press play it's starting from bar one and two and now it's going to show up here The great tip here is that you can play different velocity pads in real time. And this is especially great with the repeat button. This is super powerful for programming expressive drum parts with these 16 velocity pads. So for example, if I select the snare, now all of these pads will be different velocities of that same snare pad, right? Maybe I wanna do a, a snare roll and just ascend up these pads, right? Makes it easy. 
it's a good thing to note that these different velocity pads can be selected to program into the sequencer as well. So maybe we want to program super dynamic hits, right? For the beginning of a phrase, stuff like this. And then maybe over here, we add in some more intense notes. Pro tip, if you hold the layout button, it will give you temporary access to your loop selector controls up here. Let's say you're programming this beat and you actually just want to focus on the first section of the loop. You can do that and then let go and then you're back in 64 pad grid mode. You can hold shift and hit layout to lock it there. This is actually a happy medium where you get more pads and you have your loop selector, but you lose the sequencer. By default, a drum rack selects the whole drum rack. So if I were to hit the hot swap button here, you'll notice that everything is blinking on and off, telling me that I am swapping the entire drum rack. And if I wanted to just change out specific pads instead of the whole drum rack, I would wanna select this pad button here. And then whatever pad I have, will be selected to swap out. Now, when I hit the swap, hot swap button, you'll notice that it loads immediately to drum hits and I can start to browse around for a different kick sound maybe. When you have the pad selected, you can select it again to open up more control. Now we can see the sample that is loaded on this pad and we can adjust all these settings, right? Which is super powerful. And if we go back here, we can change the transposition. Right, we can control choke groups if we wanted to, all that fun stuff. Another thing worth noting is that in hot swap mode, when you have a pad selected, you. right, and you hit hot swap, it will automatically load the last section that you had for that specific pad. I go back here and I go to multi and we go here and we hot swap it automatically brings me to drum hits, right? And this can be useful, but it can also be super annoying if you're programming your own drum racks and you want to place different samples that are not all from the same category. A fun tip for you here is that, let's say I wanted a cymbal sound in this pad, right? Well, if the pad was empty and I hit hot swap, it's gonna bring me to the crash because that's what it was there before. But let's say I wanted a snare sample there for some reason, right? So all I'd have to do is select the snare sample, hold duplicate, hit it, put it there, right? So now I've effectively duplicated this pad in this position, right? And now with this selected, I can hot swap and it'll bring me to snares, right? So it's a quicker way of working so you can access the actual menu that you want quicker. Just a fun tip, if you hold shift and select a drum rack pad, you can change the color of that pad specifically to any color that you want. By default, every step corresponds to a 16th note, okay? And you can change this grid. So for example, right now you can see that this scene button is selected. So when I play this, the grid value is 16th notes, right? 1E and a 2E and a 3E and a 4E and a, right? All that kind of stuff. We can also reduce the resolution to, let's say, eighth notes and get twice as much resolution for what the sequencer is showing us, right? So now it's showing us four bars instead of two. You'll notice that it's only looping those first two, right? You could even go down a quarter note if you only wanted to work with quarter notes, or you could go to something crazy like 30 second notes. You can also go into triplet grids, quarter note triplet, eighth note triplet, 16th note triplet, 30 second note triplet. And in these grids, you'll notice that these two columns are grayed out and we only have six columns that are kind of lit up and have an option to be sequenced. And this represents our triplet timing, right? One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You have three counts for every beat in your bar, right? So you can hold mute to mute steps. So you'll notice that the pad gets grayed out, but the note is still there. So if you want to temporarily remove notes without deleting them, that is a great tip. If you want to unmute them, hold mute again, and simply tap them. If you wanted to copy the page of steps to another section of your loop, all you have to do is hold duplicate, select the loop selector pad of the page you want to copy, and then hit the destination page, right? So I'm gonna hit it there. So now I've effectively pasted what was on loop one into loop three. And note that if you're duplicating something on top of pre-existing steps, that it won't replace those steps. It will simply paste it on top of those steps. If you want to delete specific pages in your loop selector, all you have to do is hold delete and select that page and it clears that page. Here's the legend of colors for the step sequencer, okay? So if a pad is gray, that means that step does not contain a note. If the pad has a color, in this case, the kick drum, it has a step, okay? And just note that the velocities are indicated by the brightness of that color, right? So if I were to go ahead and hit accent and program in 
a couple really strong kick drums, you can see the difference in velocity there. If I hold mute and mute a couple things, you'll notice that these slightly lit great pads represent muted notes. And fun little fact that this organization of the different root notes are separating the root notes by fifths, right? Which is the same thing as the circle of fifths. Very handy to learn a little bit more music theory that we have our circle of fifths essentially represented by the order of these root notes. Adjusting this layout control will change the relationship of the tuning between these various rows. Right now it's tuned in fourths, so we have C, F, B, so on and so forth. But if we wanted to change this, we could tune in thirds, right? Which is pretty strange, but you'll notice how the arrangement of the root notes have changed. In the bottom row, we can still play the scale, just like before. But now ascending, we only have to go up two pads to play that scale. We can also change this to sequential, which you can see is essentially giving you a bunch of octaves, <laughs> right? This is just a fun way to visualize your music differently. If you really want to unlock push as a fully expressive melodic instrument, then you definitely want to be playing around in chromatic mode where you can see all the notes that are available. But you still get the benefit of seeing the notes that you have selected in your scale parameters up here lit up on the pads, right? One of the advantages of chromatic mode is that you have repeatable shapes. In, in key mode, that's a major triad. This is actually a minor triad, but you'll notice that the shape is the same versus that in, in chromatic mode, that's a major triad and a minor triad looks different, but a minor triad will always have that shape. No matter where you play it, right? The next thing to highlight is the fixed on or off button in the top right over here. And what this will do is with fixed off, no matter what scale I choose, if I'm C major, if I'm G major, if I'm D major, you'll notice that the pads literally just magically rearrange themselves to represent that scale, right? So there's D major, and then I can switch to G. There's G major, back to C. Right, so it just changes the layout of all the pads. If you hit fixed mode on, and you go to let's say D major, you'll notice that, oh my God, all the pads shifted. So basically with fixed mode on, the pads remain in the same position, no matter what scale you have selected. So in other words, that will always be C, right? You can also bend chords into each other, which is super trippy. It can be a little tough to perform, but it's really cool that you can bend chords into each other because it's per note pitch bend, right? You can also bend chords into different chord qualities. So let's try that. And a pro tip here is that in the melodic sequencer, you can also access your loop length control. To access this in this mode, you can just hold the layout button and you'll notice that this whole row actually turn into our loop selectors. And if you wanna lock the loop selector, on the top here, you can hold shift and layout. And now the loop selector will be locked to the top so we can sequence in notes and navigate the loops we want. If you want to unlock the loop selector from up here, just hit layout again, and now it's unlocked. And here's the color legend for the loop selector control specifically, okay? So if something is unlit, like these four pads here, it means that that page is outside the loop. If it's gray, it means that this page is within the loop, but it's not currently visible in the step sequencer. If something is white, like this first one, that page is visible in your step sequencer section, right? But it's not currently playing. And then whatever is green is currently playing. And then if you're recording, it will be red for recording. A fun tip here is you can hold select and select the notes of a chord and program in a whole chord on a step. You can also do this by holding specific notes. So maybe we want these notes, right? We want this on that step. Right? So you can just hold the notes and then program it to the step that you want. Here's the legend of colors for the pads in this mode. So the pad of a track's color is the root note of whatever scale you have selected. If it's a lighter shade of that track's color, it means the pad is selected. As you can see, this root note is selected. If I select this, that note is selected. If I hold select and select multiple, all of those pads are selected. You'll see that whenever a pad turns green, it means it's being played from the sequence. And then if a pad is white, it is just other notes of the scale that are not the root note. And then finally, if you wanna copy the notes of one step to another, you can simply hold duplicate, select that step, 
and then paste it to where you want it. If playback is continuing and you've stopped the recording, if you hit record again, then it will toggle overdub mode. Let's give that a go. Two, three, four. So now we're looping, right? If I hit record again, I can add notes. If you hold the fixed length button, you'll see this phrase sync off or on, right? So you can toggle this here. And what this does is it allows you to start recording a clip later offset into the start time. So I have four bars set on my fixed length and I set it on and now I'm just gonna hit play. And then as this is playing, I'm gonna hit record and it's gonna start recording me at a later part of that clip. So I wanted to jump in here. So you'll notice how I recorded the idea just in the second part of this clip. The repeat button here allows you to set the repeat rate of notes that you can record in real time. If I hit this button, then the scene button controls will change the resolution of the repeat. So for now, right, we have eighth notes. I could turn this to 16th notes. And this is really powerful once you start doing MPE stuff, can change the subdivision as you're playing as well. Pro tip is that this repeat function pairs very nicely with your swing control, right? So if I hit this, we can go to swing amount. Let's go to something exaggerated, like 40% or something. Enable repeat, and now this repeat will have a swing to it. Record quantization on or off is a handy function to access. With this on, what will happen is when you are recording MIDI, it will automatically quantize to whatever you have set here after you start recording. Notice how that's perfectly on the grid, even though I didn't hit quantize because it got quantized automatically as soon as I stopped recording. Another tip here is that when working with drums, right, you can actually press and hold the quantize button and then select a pad to only quantize the notes of that pad. So for example, I programmed in this kick drum a while ago, but it's not perfectly on time as you can see in the clip view, right? So if I go ahead and hold quantize, right, have my quantize settings and I hit the pad, it will only quantize my kick drum. So you can see the kick drum has now been snapped to the grid. If you want to trigger the arrangement recording while in session view, you can hold shift and then hit record. And this will actually record to arrangement view in the background of push, even though you can't access arrangement view. This is something that I'm going to do a lot because when I'm jamming, coming up with ideas, my last step is to be like, all right, I'm just going to print this into an arrangement, regardless of the quality, to look at it at a later date. And I use the shift and then record so I can record my performance and playing and triggering clips to arrangement view. If you wanna learn more about my philosophies, my methodologies, and the system that I use for myself, as well as the one that I teach my clients, I invite you to check out the masterclass with the link below which will bring you through a step-by-step -step process so you can compose, produce, and mix your own music at a pro level and become a full stack music creator. Pro tip that you can hold shift to adjust the transposition in sense instead of whole semitones, right? If you hold shift, you can go into sense if you really got to fine tune your sample. When you're adjusting MIDI clips for melodic instruments, we go to edit mode, you'll notice that we get pitch. If you wanted to, if there was a note in your melodic sequence that was not the right pitch, instead of re-recording the whole part, you could select that specific note and change the pitch. In drums, you can see drum pad. You can actually change what note is playing what pad after the fact, which is super handy. Let's say this note, instead of being a hi-hat, well, I wanted this to be a snare, right? So I could just literally change this to being a snare right, by moving the drum pad. And always remember that in your sequence review, you can edit notes like this, and just keep in mind that the settings you have in this step editing mode are different than in per note editing mode. That's something to play around with. And a pro tip for when you're editing 
clips in clip. If you want to select all of the notes for a specific pad, you can hold select, right? And then hit that pad and hold it. And now you have access to edit all of the notes for that specific pad in your sequence. So just a quick word on monitoring is that audio tracks by default will be set to auto, which will allow you to hear its input when it's record armed, as well as any clips as they're being played. If you want to monitor the input all the time of that audio track, let's say you have a guitar plugged in or your vocals fed into push and you always want to hear them regardless of what's happening, then set the monitor to in to permanently monitor that track's input. If you're recording a stereo instrument, such as a guitar pedal or two microphones recording the same audio source, then you want to hit link one and two to make sure that one and two become two sides of a stereo signal. One thing to note is that when you're working with audio clips, you can use the convert button to convert the audio clip to various different things. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit this convert button. You can see that we can convert this audio sample to a simpler. Now we have a new track that got created with a simpler device on it that will play this sample and we can play this bottle in a melodic way, right? Believe it or not, that is the sound of a bottle. A super awesome hack when you have slices of a sample that you've loaded in or audio you've recorded, right? Whatever it is, or you're resampling a MIDI performance and you've got slices. If you wanna go deeper with the control over your individual slices, you can hit the convert button. You can convert this to a drum rack. We now have all of these slices on individual pads in the drum rack. Effectively, what it does is it creates new simpler devices for all of these slices. And now you can control all of these samples independently and adjust their transposition. You can have add effects, you can sequence them in. It unlocks a lot of possibility for your slices and brings it to a whole other performable drum kit. Pro tip for you, if you want to delete the automation you've recorded onto a parameter, you just have to hold delete and then tap the encoder of that parameter and it will delete the automation, right? You can see that there's a little white dot that shows that there's automation on something. Fun fact that if you hold delete and tap an encoder that doesn't have automation, it will restore it to its defaults for that device. If you wanna re-enable your automation, all you have to do is hold shift and press automate and that will re-enable all the automation that you have recorded and that you've overridden by changing the parameter. You can also automate specific steps in a sequencer, which is super overpowered. And I'm gonna show you this with this drum kit. So you can record automation using the steps in the step sequencer. To record automation on a step, all you have to do is hold that step. So let's say this specific hi-hat and you can change the filter and you'll notice that now we have a little automation indicator and now you'll notice that if i play this this parameter will automate to that just for this step you can also set step automation on steps that don't have notes let's say maybe here we wanted to have a low cut filter just for that step then we can do that and when we do playback look at this automated control and keep in mind that in the first mix mode with drum racks you can open them up and mix all of the pads in your drum rack directly on mix view by opening up a rack and you can also do the same with your group right if you close your group there's your group mix but if you open it up you can control the level of all the tracks within your group and just another tip if you're in note mode and you want to temporarily access session pad mode you can press and hold this to temporarily access this trigger something and go back here if you want to access session pad mode specifically but again you can launch things directly up here in the session view display but here's the color legend for the pads in session pad mode so if a pad has the same color as the track that means that slot contains a clip if you want to change the color of any of your pads, hold shift and select it, and you can change the color of that pad and that clip. So maybe you want this one to be green to remember something, so on and so forth. If something is flashing green, that means that that clip is queued up to launch. And if we go ahead and stop all these clips and go ahead and start one, right, so we have that drum beat. And you'll notice that when I start to hit another pad, it's gonna start on the downbeat, it's flashing green. Right, so now we have another layer going on. And if a pad is unlit, it means there's no clip there. And just a little fun tip is that if you wanna stop a clip, you can hit an empty pad outside the playing clip to stop it. Another mode you can access within session pad mode is called session overview mode. If you hold shift and hit layout, 
you get access to session overview. And what this is, is essentially each pad becomes an eight by eight grid of clips. By doing this, you get a whole matrix of 64 scenes by 64 tracks. Let's touch on syncing Ableton and push. So what you make in standalone mode can be transferred directly into Ableton. And you can also transfer sets from Ableton directly into push and work on them away from the computer or perform with them live. So to connect push and live, they have to be connected to the same Wi-Fi network. So once again, you can just hit this little settings gear and then go to Wi-Fi and make sure that you are connected to the same network as your computer that is running live. Then from there, you can move over to Ableton, command comma to open your settings. And you wanna make sure that the enable push button is on. Go into the library tab and then make sure that show push is enabled. And what this will do is allow you to see push in your browser. So now with the browser open, we can go to push and we can access push directly from here. So when you open it, it will prompt you for a code, right? Which right here it says, 184070, 184070. And then I can connect to my push. And now I can see all the projects inside of push. And if I want to click and drag projects into push from my browser, then I can do so from here. Whoa, we made it 67 tips. I hope that was useful for you. Let me know in the comments down below what you like about Push 3, how you're using it, what kind of music you make. I'd love to know in the comments down below. And just a handful of these tips will be a game changer for your process, your workflow, and to help you make better music faster. But if you're interested in learning how to play Push 3 like an instrument, because it is an expressive instrument first and foremost, I invite you to check out this playlist that I created going over music theory specifically on Push so that you can learn how to play it, play chord progressions, develop your rhythm, motifs, melodies, all that good stuff by going through that playlist. So if you're interested in that, I will see you in that next video.